Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what and why we believe as we do. It's a time for the open-minded and a time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe, those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. And as my partner, Ravinder, who is here in the studio with me, often says, I'm quite willing to be uncertain. Uncertainty is at least staging me in preparation to learn something. So say hello to everyone, Ravinder. Share your special insight for the day. You always have something really wonderful to say. And please tell everyone how they can learn more about our show. That brought a giggle to you, did it? Well, that's how to inspire inspirational thoughts, isn't it? It's like you always say something wonderful, and then my mind goes an absolute blank. Actually, I would say, you know, today I'm really appreciating our show. Um, one of the problems I have is my pile of books that I want to read is growing larger and larger every single time. Uh, but on the other hand, if I don't ever get to read the books, I have still learned a whole bunch anyway, because I think it just helps having you read the books and tell us about it and have the questions, and then we can highlight the important bits of information. So one day I hope to get to my pile of books, um, but in the meantime, if you don't have time to read, go back and check the archives. We've got you know almost 15 years of wonderful radio shows, and they only get better and better, and we have some incredible guests coming on, a whole bunch to learn. So yeah, there you go. Go check out our archives at ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. All right. Now, you know, I really hate to disappoint you, I know the price I pay when that happens. Oh, dear. <laughs> but we generally are only able to kind of lightly gloss over the material. So there isn't going to be a substitute for actually getting in and reading those books. But That's it's... why I recommend them so strongly. You know, the guests we bring to this show... I believe, made, you know, significant contributions. And um, those contributions can't be summarized in an hour. Absolutely. But it does open doorways to different ways of thinking in the mind. So even if you don't have all the information, you are aware of something more. And I think that's invaluable. I agree with that. Totally. All right. In this week's Spotlight, I want to discuss emotion. Many people believe that intellect should rule emotion, while others are convinced that emotion must be somehow married to mind in order to maximize both. And at that, there are those who insist emotion should trump all else. And perhaps that's true in some scenarios. I mean, when you think about something like love, uh, how do you intellectually decide whether... I should, you know, love this person or I shouldn't love this person. So, the fact is, hard research has a place for all of it. There are times that emotions should rule and times that emotions should not enter the equation at all. Balancing the two is something that sounds simple, but it's quite difficult in many domains of life. To further complicate the matter, we find that many so-called intellectual activities are so integrated in bias of some sort or another that although one may argue that they are clear-thinking, rational people, when you point out flaws in their logic based on something such as confirmation bias, a Texas sharpshooter fallacy, etc., they become very emotional in their denials. So the relevant question should perhaps be one of how do we manage emotions instead of including or excluding them? 
In other words, accepted emotions accompany us regardless of our activity or intellectual pursuit and choose to become aware of their influence so that it becomes possible to manage them. Our times demand that we become more aware of our emotions because there are altogether too many unmanaged outbursts full of hatred and vitriol in our society. It therefore becomes incumbent on all who wish to see civility raised to at least attempt to control their emotional actions, reactions. In order to even begin this process, we must recognize that many experts argue that emotions are not consciously controlled. That is, we don't consciously choose our emotions. Rather, we become consciously aware of them. We don't say to ourselves, okay, it's time to be angry or jealous. The emotion arises out of the unconscious, and once this happens, we become conscious of the emotion, even if we initially fail to properly identify it for what it is. Once aware of an emotion, we can choose to manage it. Here is where the conscious mind chooses to allow the emotion to show, to express itself, or to be managed. I once had a professor who pointed out that cortical inhibition may be the highest act of humanness. After all, there's more cortex in the brain than anything else. Managed emotions rely upon rational processes and to some extent can be conditioned and they can be inhibited. My suggestion, if you wish to manage your emotions, ask yourself a few questions. Begin by asking yourself, how do I feel about this situation? What do I think I should do about it? What effect would that have for me and for other people? Does this action fit with my values? If not, what else could I do that might fit better? I learned the hard way to install a break before expressing emotion. My break is to walk away for a moment. Sometimes that's to excuse myself for a glass of water or a restroom break or some other simple way of stepping away. And sometimes it's just a mental break, a brief pause, inserting something to divert my thoughts. The short break provides the opportunity to manage my responses according to how I rationally would want to behave. <clears throat> Those are my thoughts. As always, I welcome yours. Ravinder, what have, you got to say? what have you got to say on the subject? You know, I've got a short experience of my own that I can share with you that I think ties into this. I'm not sure what the answer is today, uh, but there was a period in my own life when I was very religious. I got very deeply into the Sikh religion. Um, and at that time in my life, I was around 18 at the time, I was very hot-headed, very passionate, very fiery, you know. I mean, if something upset me, I could, you know, jump up and down and lots of things would upset me because I had these definite ideas of right and wrong. And then a friend said to me, stop getting so passionate by everything, stop getting so upset, turn it over to God just put it in God's lap and at that time as I said I was very very religious so that was easy for me to do so anything that came along that got me worked up I took the idea and I put it in God's lap I could see that in, in my mind and I did it really really well and then I discovered how dull life became you know, it, it did. It's like you have to have something to look forward to. You have to have something to be excited about. You have to have things that you care about. Um, otherwise, what's the point, I suppose? Um, I think that there's a balance between the two, but I would be really interested to hear what our guest today has to say about it all. Um, I That practice, I finally decided I, I just give up so yeah, that's not something that I do anymore because I get I do get a great deal of value in 
finding things to be attached to. But as I said, it, it, it's a hard balance. It's a hard balance because there are definitely times that, yeah, you don't want your emotions going off crazy. You want to think rationally and sensibly about stuff. You want to handle the things that you can handle and let other things go. Yeah, well, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm very aware of your emotional oh. outbursts. <laughs> Oh, now you're in trouble. Every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show featured Professor Barrett Brogard, and we discussed her work and book, The Superhuman Mind. Jeff wrote, great show. I didn't realize that there were ways to stimulate so much added brain power. Nell wrote, I loved your guest this week. I have always wondered how people can become so gifted from things like a blow to the head. Moving on, Robert wrote, good evening, Dr. Taylor. I felt it appropriate to message you. I hope you do as well. I have begun a journey, which led me to your books. Presently reading, I believe, I must thank you for not only the literature, but also breathing new life into my faith. Please allow me to explain. This journey has led me to many different authors, Sages, movies, recordings, and the like. Each is entertaining, informative, and appropriate for the period in which it comes into my awareness. However, lately I have been drawing blanks, unmotivated, uninterested, and ultimately unplugged from this ongoing situation which I found oh so enthralling just a short time ago. Then, as it seems to be the pattern in my life, someone, something, or some circumstance springs a new albeit unaware, mentor onto my path. Your works, point of view, and understandings fall into what I need to know now. Thank you. Well, I am very flattered by your words, Robert, and I'm very glad that you find them helpful. Thank you. Dana wrote, I hope you are well. I wanted to tell you that I have been a fan of Intertalk since 2006. The first time I used the Intertalk weight loss program, I lost 20 pounds, and that was in 2006. And Steve wrote, you'll like this one, Ravinder. Dear Ravinder, very respectfully, you and your husband, Dr. Taylor, are terrific people and very gifted. Dr. Taylor knows how to put titles together for one to either improve on something or overcome something as well as be able to know how to do something. You, Ravinder... Know what titles to recommend for someone needing to be better at something. You are always very helpful, and I always say to myself after being assisted by you, good old Ravinder, she always knows what to recommend to one to either overcome or improve on something. The very best to you and your husband. What have you got to say to that, Rav? You're right. I do like that one. You know, I enjoy talking to uh, customers on the phone. Um, I enjoy participating in their in their journey. Um, I suppose I do. I spend a great deal of time trying to figure out how to take the next step for myself. So, I think I find that our customers teach us as often as we're able to help them. They do. That's my experience. Absolutely. So. All right. That's all the time we're going to take for letters today. But please keep your comments coming. We do appreciate your feedback. You can opine by sending me an email to Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at eldontaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. Now to today's show, How to Be a Stoic with Professor Massimo Pialucci. So let me tell you a little about today's guest. Massimo Pialucci is the K.D. Irini Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York. His academic work is in evolutionary biology, philosophy of science, the nature of pseudoscience, and the practical philosophy of Stoicism. His books include How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life, the subject of today's show, Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk, and his most recent book is A Field Guide to Happy Life, 53 Brief lessons for living so on that let's get him in here welcome to provocative enlightenment professor massimo pialucci thank you it's a pleasure to be here that's my pleasure indeed i love your work i love your book um professor we like to learn three things from our guests 
What is the message? Who is the messenger? And, of course, how do we use that? <laughs> to that end, please share with us what you're passionate about and why. I'm passionate about a number of things, actually, but I guess the ones that are most uh, pertinent to today's conversation are the philosophy of stoicism, which I think is potentially life-changing for the better for, for people who take a serious look at it. I'm also very passionate about the issue of uh, science versus pseudoscience. I'm a scientist, actually, as a background, and I see that the damage that uh, pseudoscientific belief or bad belief in general is doing to society. So I tend to be passionate about that as well. Cool. I've got some questions for you about that as we develop today's show. You heard today's spotlight, though, Professor. What have I got wrong? Yes. I'm not sure you got anything wrong. Uh, I think it's a question of uh, emphasis. So when we, you were talking about emotions, for instance, uh, you know, research uh, in cognitive psychology and neuroscience is still obviously ongoing. So uh, anybody who says, you know, this is the final word about emotions and reason, uh, I think it's at least premature. However, the more we know about the brain, the more it's clear that these, these sharp separation between reasons and reason and emotions is just not there. It is true that there are different broadly defined areas of the brain that are primarily responsible for ex executive decision making. Those are the prefrontal, you know, uh, areas as and then, then there are others that are uh, more close to the root of emotional responses like the amygdala. But it's also very true that these areas are massively interconnected so that you just cannot separate emotions from from reason. The two are so intertwined that the best we can do, in fact, the most reason, reasonable, so to, so to speak, thing to do is to have a constant dialogue between our, you know, functional decision making uh, in, in, in our brain and our emotional responses. Amen. Amen. Before we get into your book, sir, I'm interested in your views regarding free will, specifically <laughs> the role of compatibilism. Please flesh this out for us and clarify why you hold yourself to be an agnostic with regard to free will. So I tend to actually think of myself as a compatibilist. Now, compatibilism is a position that is actually very common in modern philosophy of mind. Uh, I would argue it's the most common position, but it's an ancient position. It goes back at, at the very least to the Stoics, actually, about 23 centuries ago. And compatibilism is, uh, essentially says that, look, the universe is, as far as we know, governed by an unbroken web of cause and effect. Some people refer to that model as a deterministic model of the universe. But determinism is a fancy philosophical word that actually carries a lot of baggage, so I try to stay away from it. Basically, what we're saying is, look, nothing happens unless there is a cause. There's no effect without a cause. So no, no miracles, so to speak. Nothing suspends the laws of nature. Everything that happens, including human behavior, including human decision making, is the result of other causes. That said, in, in terms of free will specifically, uh, again, I actually don't even like the word free will because it immediately raises the question, well, free from what exactly? A lot of psychologists and philosophers today use the word volition, actually, instead of free will. So our ability to make decisions. There's no question that we do make decisions. We're capable of making decisions, that we, we value. In fact, one of the best things about human beings is that we're really complex, sophisticated decision-making machines. We take a lot of input from the outside, uh, sensorial data, opinions from other people, and so on and so forth, and then we process these, this information through very complex internal mechanisms, and then we come up with a decision. So a compatibilist basically says, look, there is no contradiction in saying that everything in the universe is the result of cause and effect, and at the same time maintaining that my decisions are my decisions and not somebody else's. That is, I'm responsible for my, for my decisions. Why? Well, because I am part and parcel of the universal web of cause and effect. That web doesn't control me as if I were a puppet. It goes through me. Part of who I am is, in fact, a section of that web of cause and effect, and therefore my decisions are mine, and I'm responsible for them. When you look at a lot of today's research and, and the controversy, and of course this controversy goes back to Ben Libet's work with a uh, cortical evoked potential, the so-called P, well, not so-called, but the, the P300 yeah. wave. Um, but today, you know, we have some MRI work that shows uh, 
a technician can know what we're going to decide that is simple decisions um you know six seconds on average before a person actually makes that decision there's a lot of you know question controversy about this but there's also a great resistance um to accept the notion that largely we we are not making choices based on anything other than a program running in our subconscious i mean let's take the word volition as you put it we make decisions but the decisions are based on the input that we have available to us it's not as though there is anything like all options are available and so there are many that argue and i'm going to come back to the term free will many that argue that in the sense we think of free will usually maybe in a theological framework or in a moralistic framework, that that simply is a misnomer. Would you agree with that or not? Yeah, I would. I would agree that free will is a misnomer because, as I said a minute ago, it you know it immediately brings up the question: Well, free from what? And if you're saying that your will is free from causal influences, then uh, you're talking magic, as far as I'm concerned, as far as modern science is concerned, um, which is why you correctly pointed out that's typically a theological position. I mean, the only people that are uh, actually talking about free will in the strong sense of the term tend to be theologians, and for, for obvious reasons, because they, they want uh, human beings to be solely responsible for their decisions. I think that's a no starter in terms of modern science. But when we talk about you know neurobiology and you know experiments, as you were mentioning a minute ago uh, with the uh, your action potential and all that sort of stuff. It turns out those experiments are actually, although they've been repeated several times and amplified several times, the interpretation of those experiments is actually very much in discussion. One of the most recent papers that I read last about last year about this was actually arguing from a French group, if I remember correctly, was actually arguing that the the, the potential the red, uh, in um, uh, that that activates essentially our our actions, you know, our muscles and so on and so forth, is always fluctuating in back in the background. Constantly it goes up and down and up and down, and so just because we can measure a, a potential, you know, ready for our neurons to kick in, you know, even seconds before we actually make a decision, that does not mean at all that that decision was made subconsciously minutes ago. And in fact, even the original uh, research indicated that at best uh, the results. Uh, suggest that you know our subconscious, of course, directs or points us into certain directions in order to act. Why? Why wouldn't that be? Uh, our subconscious is part of our, uh, you know, normal functioning as as animals, but we tend to have. We also have something, you know, essentially a kind of a veto power on our actions. You know, I can be ready to spring in a certain direction. Let's say I hear a loud noise behind me, and immediately I I, I don't control my immediate reaction. My immediate reaction is one of that is connected to the fear or flight response that every animal has. So I'm ready to spring into action. But then I turn around, I look at what's happening, and it turns out it was a cat you know, making noise down the street. And so I override any kind of potential that was there. I relax, and I go my, my, my way. So it's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, conscious and unconscious thinking are related in, in very complex and fascinating ways. And there really is no problem in saying that a majority of our thinking is actually subconscious. It really should be. Because otherwise, we'll be spending too much time thinking about all sorts of trivial things. Let me give you an analogy. You know, when we uh, learned to, how to drive a car, for instance, you know, I, I learned how to drive a car in Rome, in Italy. And so it was a, a stick shift and all that sort of stuff. And it was horrifying because, like, uh, I had to control, pay attention to a number of things simultaneously while I was in the middle of, you know, chaotic traffic with people coming, zipping by very, very close to my car, et cetera, et cetera. So initially it was kind of a terrifying experience, but then little by little, a lot of my decision-making as a driver became unconscious. I got you know, more and more expert, so to speak, at driving, and therefore a lot of the, my conscious thoughts were uh, pushed back into my unconscious. And it's a good thing, because if I actually had to consciously think about everything that I want to do, every minute aspect of my life, then I would never actually live my life, or I would probably kill myself one way or another. <laughs> Amen. I, and ever, I think everybody is familiar with something like that, where you're, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been on the freeway, um, 
and some thought comes. I start following trails in my mind. Uh, and the next thing I know, I'm looking up, oh, there's my exit. And, I've, you know, maybe I've driven 30, 40, even 100 miles. And it's been very safe driving, been very alert. But I have not been consciously tending to it at all at the same time. Yeah. And I think most people have experienced that. All right, listen, we've got a break in front of us. I want to get headlong into your book when we come back. We're speaking with Professor Massimo Pialucci about his work and book, How to Be a Stoic. His work is really fascinating, and it's across many fields. And I highly recommend that you visit his website at MassimoPialucci.com. I'm going to spell that for you. It's M-A-S-S-I-M-O. P-I-G-L-I-U-C-C-I dot com. Ravinder will also post that site on our page so that you can find it easily. Okay, do please stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Professor Massimo Pialucci about his work and book, How to Be a Stoic. You can learn more about our guest and his book, and, you know, look, this is a great book, How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern World. Uh, you know, I, I I recommend a book to you nearly every week because the guests that we bring on to this show uh, have done something that I feel really genuinely contributes to our understanding or to living a better life. This is no exception. Uh, at the same time I say that, this book is packed with exercises that uh, are life-changing. So, you know, we live at a time with COVID and everything else when depression can be easily uh, a taint that we try to leave behind every day. This is a manual that I think you'll find eliminates a lot of anxiety and and just gives rise to stronger feelings uh, of wellness. And and so, again, I'm going to say, go get the book, How to Be a Stoic, Massimo Pialucci. I'll get it said correctly. All right, every week we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some real meaning to them. By now you know music psychology is a hobby of mine and a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. So, Professor, your chosen music, Fly Me to Do the Moon, performed by the one and only Frank Sinatra. Please tell us, why is this music important to you? And more importantly, how does it tell us about who you are? (laughs) <laughs> well, generally speaking, I my preference in terms of music uh, are in the area of jazz, blues, and opera. And Frank Sinatra is, of course, one of the greatest singers of all time in that in in that area. But particularly this this particular song, 
uh, was the one that my wife and I played uh, during our wedding. And so it's kind of become the soundtrack in a sense of, of, of our life. Uh, every time we hear this song, it's like we immediately go back to, uh, you know, how we how we met and, and how we fell in love and how we uh, got married. So so it's very, very meaningful because um, it's upbeat. It's, uh, it tells something in a few words. You know, this is a the great, a great song is a combination of great music and great lyric. And of course, the, the particular rendition, you know, as you know, there, there are many, many renditions of that song. And we enjoy actually a number of them. But the one by Frank Sinatra, I think, is it's the classic and it's, uh, it's one that stands out. Makes you want to grab her up and dance again, right? <laughs> See, yeah. I read your article, Professor, The Problem with Scientism. Mm. And, and I admit that due to your reputation as a skeptic, I was somewhat surprised at your position. It seems that, you know, very many skeptics, not all, of course, but very many, could be described as subscribing to something very close, if not, scientism. Please share with us your view on this and why. Yeah, you're right. That uh, I'm very unusual among so-called skeptics because I do think that scientism is a problem. You know, scientism is a term that is actually fairly difficult to define, and it can be used properly and properly. It can be used as a term of abuse or you know anything like that. But basically, what we're talking about is the notion that somebody might actually be overconfident about science, that might consider science almost as an ideology, as, as uh, something that can never be wrong or something that provides all the answers that are, that are uh, meaningful uh, to seek. And uh, there are some people that subscribe to that kind of position, whether they realize it or not. Uh, you know, no, nobody probably will come out and say, Actually, no, let me rephrase that. I actually do know a few people that come out and say, yes, I subscribe to scientific thinking. But it's very unusual. Most people say, no, no, not me. Certainly not me. But then you look at what they write, you know, you look at how they talk and say, well, actually, my friend, it looks like that is, in fact, uh, your problem. Now, why is this a problem? Because anti-science is problematic, I think. It leads, as we were er saying earlier on, to, you know, pseudoscientific belief, which does have major consequences uh, for everyday life, and, and, uh, and it's very dangerous. I mean, we're looking at it right now. We're in the middle of a pandemic, and a significant portion of the country doesn't think that it's a good idea to get vaccinated. So, you know, this bad, bad thinking, pseudoscience, really are harmful and sometimes actually kill. That said... You don't want to go to the opposite extreme, in a sense. I think of scientism as kind of the opposite extreme of the, the opposite pole to pseudoscience, where you essentially worship science and you think that every meaningful question has to have a scientific answer. Well, no, there are lots of other ways of addressing questions, of understanding things, including philosophy, obviously. Um, they just tend to be it, – it, it's important to recognize that science is in a particular business, and it's good at that particular business, but it's not in every business. Science is in the business of answering questions, formula, formulating and answering questions about how the world works, the empirical world, the actual physical world out there. And when we're talking about that sort of question, then yes, I would actually agree that nothing beats science, no other way of knowing that um, we have tried so far has actually been even – even remotely close to the uh, to, to the efficacy of science. However, right. there are questions of meaning. There are questions of you know value and so on and so forth, for which science at best can be informative, uh, and uh, sometimes it just doesn't have anything particular to say. And to pretend otherwise is a scientific uh, uh, position. I, I, I love that. I mean, and it was a great article. That's, that's why I recommend everybody actually go to your website. And, you know, pay attention, investigate you, listen to your TED Talks. Anyway, uh, coming right off of scientism, I'm going to flip the coin here. I've been accused of being a skeptic in the past, especially when it comes to some things like, you know, tapping and, well, and I'm not going to get into that. But I have been accused of being a skeptic. And as often, I've been accused of being a New Age sympathizer. There's a difference between a cynic and a skeptic, and I think a healthy skepticism is just wise in our world, especially today, as you point out with vaccines and so many other conspiracy theories out there. It seems there are plenty of claims that should be called into question. 
In your work, Nonsense on Stilts, you discuss an idea I'd like you to share with our audience, that of, in quotation marks, almost science. Please unpack that for us. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So the the issue here is that when we tend to when to think when we think about science and pseudoscience, a lot of people tend to think in very sharply dichotomous ways. You know, there is science over here with the capital S, and then there is pseudoscience over there, and the two are very clearly distinct. Well, that's true if you take the extreme examples on each side. So, for instance. Uh, with all due respect to some of your listeners who might disagree or, or not, but you know, if you think that astrology is a, is nothing other is not pseudoscience, then I think you don't you're not paying attention. Uh, astrology is pseudoscience. It's a click quintessential example of pseudoscience. Why? Well, because the theory in which it is based, uh, it doesn't stand up to scientific scrutiny. The uh, people have done experiments to test, you know, the reliability of the claims of astrologers, and astrologers failed abysmally. So, as far as we can tell. Astrology is a perfect example of pseudoscience. At the opposite extreme, you find things like, you know, fundamental physics. If anybody doesn't think that fundamental physics is a science, I don't know what to tell them. You know, it's it's quantum mechanics, for instance, is arguably the most reliable uh, scientific theory ever. It is has been confirmed like zillions of times by experiments. So there really is no question there there either. However, there is a lot of territory in between. There are a lot of areas of inquiry, there are a lot of notions, a lot of ideas that we're really not sure which way they fall. For instance, uh, you know, parapsychology, you know, studies about things like telepathy and clairvoyance and things like that. Well, I tend to be very skeptical of those. And any, every time that I looked into them, I don't find significant, you know, sufficient evidence to actually accept uh, the conclusions of, of parapsychologists. But would I put my hand on my, on the fire for that? No, I wouldn't. You know, it, it's very possible that I might have to change my mind uh, sometime down the road if the situation changes from an empirical perspective. Similarly, there are fields that are actually considered scientific, like, for instance, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But they're kind of shaky. Uh, the SETI, which is the, the acronym for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Program, has been going on for decades. Uh, we found absolutely nothing. That doesn't mean that there is nothing out there, but but we are we have zero data, and it's in a very unusual science, a science that has zero data uh, to its uh, you know to 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 talk about, to claim to claim as its own. And also the theory is pretty shaky. I mean, basically, scientific researchers are simply assuming or hoping that uh, extraterrestrials are going to have essentially the same kind of psychology as human beings. Uh, that they want to communicate, that will communicate via radio signals or something like that. We have no idea if that's true or not. We have no, we, you know, we, no knowledge whatsoever. So is this pseudoscience? No, I don't think so. But is it a full-fledged, you know, legitimate science? I don't think so either. And so that that quasi-science territory is the uh, the 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 one at the borderlines between science and pseudoscience, where things could go easily one way down or or or, or the other. If we wait a few more years and and uh, the most logical, the most reasonable thing to do at the moment is just just wait and see. It's like, OK, let, let's find out. I, I find your views just, you know, healthy. I, uh, and, and, and this is another book that our audience ought to look into. Nonsense on stilts. OK, one more question before we get into how to be a stoic. <laughs> During the past couple of weeks, we have interviewed scientists who offer panpsychism in a worldview. Mm. Now, it's my understanding that you're in a different camp from, say, <laughs> Professor yes. Barrett Brogard, who we had last week. Um, please tell us why. Well, panpsychism, first of all, there, there's a number of different versions of panpsychism. It's a kind of a, it's a really uh, varied ideas. You, you talk to two different panpsychists and they will have a very different notion of what they actually mean by that term. But broadly speaking, it's the notion that consciousness is elemental. That is, consciousness is not the result of, you know, a long period of evolution that and then appeared in only certain lineages of animals and things like that. It's really an elemental property of matter. Everything, in a sense, is conscious. That doesn't mean that electrons are thinking about what to do tomorrow morning, but it means that in some sense uh, we should think of consciousness as as a basic property of matter. Now, why would you ever think something like that? Well, because it allegedly solves a major problem in philosophy of mind, uh, and that is called, it's often referred to as the hard problem of consciousness. 
So this is the issue of it's put it's put often this way. It's like okay, so neuroscientists can tell me a lot about the brain, and they can tell me a lot about which part of the brain even are involved in conscious experiences. But you know, the only way to actually have a conscious experience is to be a conscious being. It's a first person experience. It cannot be described or explained in third person terms, which is what science tends to do. Right. Well. I actually don't think that the heart pro I think the heart problem of, of consciousness is a, is a chimera. It doesn't exist. Um, it's based on, on a misunderstanding of what of how science works. Of course, science is in the business of third party descriptions and not of first person experiences. But that isn't any problem at all in terms of explaining consciousness. If the explanation of consciousness, if and when it will come. It will come from a combination of neurobiology, evolutionary biology, all of the biological sciences. Because, why? Well, because consciousness, as far as we can tell, it's a biological phenomenon. It's a biological process. Now, however, if you're a panpsychist, you say, well, you know, I solved the problem because we don't, there is really no problem for the emergence of consciousness because everything is conscious. Um, that is not a solution, actually. Because the panpsychist still has to tell me then why is it that I can think in mountains, as far as we can tell, don't. Mountains have a lot more matter than a human being does in its brain. And allegedly, all that matter has elemental consciousness, and yet mountains don't seem to think. And, or rocks, or whatever, you know, lots, lots of things don't seem to think. We have no evidence whatsoever that they think. So it actually doesn't solve anything, but it's worse than that. Panpsychism is simply a notion that has absolutely no empirical evidence to back it up. And as a scientist, I have to say, my, pro my beliefs are proportional to the evidence. If you got no evidence, then you just got a pretty idea. But pretty ideas don't make science. There are lots of, the, the history of science is characterized by a lot of very pretty ideas that turned out to be wrong because empirically speaking, they didn't hold up to scrutiny. So we have no no way even to test panpsychism because there was this very famous uh, interesting and very illuminating I think exchange uh, a year or two ago between one of the leading leading uh, panpsychist uh, Philip Goff and one of the critics the science critics of panpsychism uh, Sabine Hossenfelder they didn't actually speak to each other directly they they basically did it through me I was kind of the intermediary <laughs> um, mm. but Hossenfelder as a physicist said look there is no evidence, there's no such a thing as elemental consciousness because if there was such a thing, then we would be able to measure it. The you know, particles, electrons, uh, quarks, and so on and so forth would behave differently from the way in which the, the standard model of physics uh, describes them to behave, and we don't see anything like that, so there is no empirical evidence. And Goff's response was, well, that's because consciousness at an elemental level simply does not have causal uh, you know, it, it's not causally efficacious. In other words, it doesn't do anything. It's inert. Right. And therefore, it cannot be tested. Well, but then, what are we talking about here? If we're talking about something that is causally in, in, inert, that doesn't do anything, can you explain why is it that I'm actually very efficaciously conscious? Why is it at an, an elemental level there is no effect of consciousness, but in fact, somehow, when we get to higher levels, there is such a thing. So either fine psychists are saying that the consciousness is elemental and it is a physical property, in which case Ossenfelder is right. It doesn't fit with the standard model in physics. And f quite frankly, anybody who goes against the standard model of physics, good luck to them. It's one of the best, uh, you know, empirically confirmed scientific theories of all time. Or you're saying that you're actually not talking about a physical uh, property at all, in which case, as far as I'm concerned, you are into, uh, you know, metaphysics of the worst kind. Um, so either way, the panpsychist position is really not tenable in terms of, uh, from an empirical perspective. And again, scientific theories have to have to make contact with the empirical. If they don't, they're not scientific theories by definition. It's like no scientist would consider a theory uh, viable or interesting unless it makes contact with the empirical. Gotcha. Thank you, Professor, for indulging me. This show came about because I think as a child, I remember wanting to have a round table where I could bring the brightest people on the planet together. I even imagined, you know, what it would be like to have 
Einstein and Planck and Aristotle and, and Socrates, you know, all at the same table where you could just ask them questions. And, <laughs> well, and you know, people you are indulging <laughs> me by responding to this. Listen, let's get to your book. I loved your book. Sure. Uh, absolutely loved your book. There are three core disciplines in Stoicism, sir. The discipline of desire, the discipline of action, and the discipline of ascent. Please briefly flesh those out for us and and how we might incorporate in our lives uh, these disciplines. So Stoicism is an ancient Greek and Roman philosophy that has one goal and one goal only, to make us live the best life that a human being can live. According to the Stoics, that that life is a life in which we use our resources, particularly our our reason, our ability to reason, our ability to solve problems, uh, to improve society. Why? Well, because we're social animals, and so life is better for everybody if society improves. So the goal of Stoicism is to make us into the most reasonable and helpful people that you can possibly become. As you pointed out, one approach, one way to do it, which goes back to an early second century Stoic philosopher named Epictetus, uh, is by way of practicing these three disciplines, desire, action, and assent. Here's what they're, what they're about. The first discipline of desire is supposed to help us reorient, reprioritize things. According to the Stoics, most of us tend to care a little too much with the kind, for the kinds of things that we, couldn't, we shouldn't care too much. So a lot of us are interested in money, fame, uh, you know, uh, a good career, uh, you know, whatever, whatever material possessions and, 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 and stuff, having a lot of stuff. According to the right. Stoics, that's the wrong priority. The, the, our priority should be to develop a good character and good judgment. Why is that? Well, because it is good judgment that allows you to use everything else. The Stoics don't have a problem with external possessions. They have no problem with money, with you know, material things, so long as you use them properly. So Epictetus, for instance, says at one point, and you're sure, you go, go ahead and make money. But the question is, once you made your money, how are you going to use it? Uh, money itself isn't going to tell you. It's your faculty of judgment that tells you. And so the discipline of desire is helping us to reorient our priorities, essentially, to make sure that we really prioritize what's important for us, which is our, our ability to make judgment, to arrive at good judgments. The discipline of action is about how to deal with other people because we live in society. We're highly social animals. And even though we can survive by our, uh, you know, on our own uh, on a deserted island, we really don't thrive unless we live in a complex society with, where, where people do all sorts of things. That means that you need to develop good ways to, to relate to other people. And according to the Stoics, uh, the way to deal with other people is by practicing three uh, of the so-called four cardinal, four cardinal virtues, courage, justice, and temperance. We have to have the courage to do the right thing, we have to, to know what that right thing to do is, how to treat other people, that's justice. And we have to do it in, good, in, in proper measure, neither too much nor too little, that's temperance. The other, the fourth cardinal virtue is called practical wisdom, and that's the knowledge of what's really good for us and what is really not good for us. And that, is, that, that virtue falls into the first uh, discipline that we just talked about, that of desire. So now we cover two, desire, how to reorient your priorities, and action, how to deal with other people, how to interact with other people. The third one, the discipline of ascent, essentially helps us to do, remember we were talking about earlier on uh, about how to learn to drive a car and then initially you have to pay attention to everything and then at some point it becomes kind of second nature. Well, the right. discipline of uh, ascent aims at doing the same thing for our judgments. Initially, when we're training ourselves as Stoics, we have to really ke think carefully and deliberately about all sorts of stuff. But eventually, it has to become second nature. We need to, treat, to train ourselves to do the right thing automatically without really thinking about it. Why? Well, because in, in real life, a lot of times you can't, you don't have the time to think about it. You have to, uh, to act in the moment. You have to have the right instinct about how to act, and the discipline of ascent is supposed to help us essentially reshape our instincts so that we tend to do the right thing Im immediately, more often than not. Professor, we don't have a lot of time, but in about a minute or so, if you can, one of my favorite chapters in your book is chapter 14, Practical Spiritual Exercises. 
you you actually you know lay out some really interesting exercises and i and i just wonder as i read that do you consider yourself to be a spiritual person well, depending on what you mean by spiritual, yes. I mean, the, you know, the word spirit can have, of course, uh, supernatural implications. And if that's your cup of tea, uh, absolutely. But it can also refer to, to your uh, mind and psychology, right? So, so to, the, right. to the notion that you're actually serene and a lot of, uh, and you're at peace with yourself and with other people. And uh, a lot of uh, stoic practice is about developing serenity, tranquility, and because you know how to act in the world and you're okay with the basic notion that you're going to do your best and then sometimes things are going to work out your way and other times you're not going to be, they're not going to work uh, your way because that's life. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. You know, I'm going to tell our readers out there, if you get this book for no other reason than to read Chapter 14, I think you should do that. But it is a great book and it is packed throughout. Is there a good better best way to reach out to you and learn more about you professor well people can follow me on twitter at the m pilucci m p i g l i u c c i or uh, they can check my website which uh, is the one that you uh, uh, mentioned earlier massimo pilucci.com it's also the same exact site is uh, if, if people don't want to spell out my name which is horrible uh, they can go to figsinwinter.com all right. It has been a pleasure talking with you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to probably, I mean, I'm going to have my staff reach out to you and bring you back to the show. You're a wealth of information. Um, I just truly appreciate you. So thank it's you for sharing your work and experiences with us, Professor. All right. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show, learned something, and I hope you'll join us again next week, same time and same place. All right. Until then, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.